Good morning. Um, welcome to this morning's Grand Rounds. Uh, Grand Rounds will be virtual only through the end of this month, and then we'll reassess starting up a small in-person audience again. For today's presentation, please type any questions you have in the Q&A pod. We'd also like to thank today's exhibitors, Bristol Myers Squibbs and Edwards Life Sciences. Both have virtual exhibits with links that will be chatted out. Today, I'm so, so honored to have um, Dr. Laxmi Mehta join us. Um, Dr. Laxmi Mehta is a non-invasive cardiology cardiologist and professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine at Ohio State University. She holds the Sarah Ross Soder Endowed Chair in Women's Cardiovascular Health, is the Section Director of Preventive Cardiology and Women's Cardiovascular Health and Director of Lipids Clinic at OSU. She is also the Vice Chair of the Wellness for the Department of Internal Medicine at OSU. She was the first female president governor of the Ohio chapter of the American College of Cardiology. She has served on the national ACC as a member of the Lifelong Learning Oversight Committee, Membership Committee, and Task Force on Diversity and Inclusion. And she's also the chair of the Board of Trustees Task Force on Clinician Wellness. Additionally, she is the past chair of the National AHA's Cardiovascular Disease in Women and Special Populations Committee. Dr. Maida specializes in uh, prevention, women's cardiovascular health, and cardiac imaging. She is a diplomat of the American Board of Cardia Clinical Lipidology. Her clinical and research interests include obstructive and non-obstructive coronary artery disease in women. She is an educator and a media spokesperson regarding prevention, cardiovas women's cardiovascular health. Dr. Mehta chaired three AHA scientific statements on acute myocardial infarction in women, intersection of breast cancer and cardiovascular disease, as well as cardiovascular considerations in pregnancy. She received her medical degree from Northeastern Ohio University's College of Medicine and Pharmacy. She completed her internal medicine residency training, clinical cardiology fellowship, and advanced imaging training in CT MRI at William Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, Michigan. And we're so pleased to have her here today, and she'll be presenting on burnout, a barrier to clinician wellness. Dr. Mehta, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Saxena. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with you all, and I'm glad it's virtual because I heard your weather is uh, far worse than ours here in Ohio. Um, but I'm glad to talk to you about burnout um, in medicine and in cardiology. It really uh, existed even pre-COVID, um, but since COVID, it has increased significantly in terms of prevalence as well as the ability to speak about it. And it's become a real public health concern um, that uh, needs to be not only discussed, but really addressed. Um, I have no financial disclosures to report, um, but I'm at risk for burnout, and I would say um, so too are each of you. And the risk of burnout can vary throughout um, our careers or years, um, and, and it just depends on what's going on situational for each one of us at that time. And so the objectives of today's uh, discussion is one, to define burnout and identify the repercussions of physician burnout. Two is to identify key contributors to burnout amongst cardiologists. And then three is to review some potential well-being solutions on a professional and personal level. So to start off with what is um, burnout, because I think you know prior to recent years, people always said, oh, I'm just burning out. But, but in reality, it's, um, it's defined as emotional exhaustion, such as chronic fatigue, insomnia, um, loss of appetite, along with a cynicism or detachment, which is loss of enjoyment or pessimism, feeling isolated, and then ineffectiveness or lack of accomplishment, including irritability, lack of productivity, while working in a self-perceived stressful environment. And so um, what is very stressful for one may not be for uh, another, and it's how um, we perceive sometimes that stress can be. Um, in, in medicine, uh, in the past, we always focused on the quadruple aim. And uh, I think that many of our institutes still kind of focus on that, and that's to improve the patient experience, hence the patient satisfaction scores, lower healthcare costs, and improve po population health, which, which is all the quality metrics. 
Um, but we've all advocated that there really has to be the quadruple aim uh, because for in order to, for any of the three components of the triple aim to even take an effect, you need to have clinician well-being um, and us to be engaged members and at the top of our game to be able to um, meet the other parts of the quadruple aim. And people can be uh, in various spectrums. So on the far right, you can see this um, figure uh, that shows that on the x-axis is mental well-being and on the y-axis is symptoms of burnout. And the intent is that we all have optimal well-being and we have no lack of symptoms of burnout, then we would be in the green uh, box up at the top right, which is the content state. And if you have severe burnout symptoms, as well as minimal mental health well-being, you'd be in the distressed state. But there's many people that kind of float in between in the orange and yellow, where they may have severe burnout symptoms, but they have good well-being, mental well-being, or they have uh, no burnout symptoms, but minimal uh, well-being. And, and those are the people that we also need to make sure we don't forget and leave behind and help them along. So well, what do, difference does it make? Like, what are the repercussions of physician burnout? And this is um, a nice ar uh, article uh, from the Mayo, in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, that there truly are personal and professional uh, ramifications Certainly the professional ramifications are what we've talked about, the decreased quality of care, the decreased patient satisfaction, decreased productivity, and then in turn increased uh, turnover uh, amongst the physicians or even amongst our um, allied staff. Um, and each uh, physician that turns over, it can cost about a million dollars for the Institute just to replace that person, the onboarding, the loss of productivity during that time and so forth. But the personal ramifications are devastating as well. There's broken relationships, alcohol and substance abuse, uh, depression, um, and, and uh, it can, so burnout can lead to depression or people who have underlying burn, depression can uh, further manifest while they're burnt out. And then suicide is, is uh, in fact um, a prevalent and, and a concern. Now, they say about one physician commits suicide a day within the United States, and we know that some of the suicide rates, um, sorry, the number of suicides may have increased around the pandemic time, and, and there actually are some legislations that are occurring at a national level to um, help with the mental health of our healthcare workers, physicians, nurses, and so forth, um, to help uh, reduce the uh, um, burnout, but more importantly, also to help reduce depression and suicide uh, that it is occurring um, within uh, the healthcare workforce. Well, as, as a um, profession, how do we compare to the general population? So if we look at physicians in general, um, in red here, and the general population in the thinner green line, uh, looking at burnout from 2011 to 2017, the rates of burnout have been high amongst physicians and have remained higher than the general population and the general working population, I should add. And then when we look at work-life balance on the right, you can once again see that um, our uh, work-life balance is poor compared to other um, working populations. So clearly burnout rates and work-life balance are poor, lower in physicians compared to the general um, working population. And so there are some inherent risks of being in the healthcare uh, workforce. So that was data on physicians in general, but so what does our numbers look like within uh, cardiology. So this is um, our physician uh, professional life survey that the ACC did. The last survey we did was in about 2015 and we added questions on um, burnout uh, using the mini Z uh, questionnaire. And so uh, there were about 2,274 cardiologists and fellows in training all US that uh, completed this survey. Um, and uh, the majority of respondents said they, they, they were not having burnout symptoms. But if you look a little closely, less than 24% of the cardiologists and FITs were saying that they enjoyed their work and they were happy. Um, and in actuality, almost 50% said they were highly stressed and almost 27% said they were burned out. And it's this yellow here of the 50% that are saying that they're stressed um, can tip one way or the other. And, um, and that's going to be alarming and, and why we need to, 
to intervene. Um, interestingly, our data also showed that mid-career cardiologists, so those of us who are eight to 21 years into practice, had a higher prevalence of experiencing burnout, even compared to our fellows in training and our early, early career uh, uh, members and, and uh, even late career cardiologists. Don't know why that exactly is. Is it because the late career cardiologists are nearing retirement and some of them may be working part-time or they see the light in their tunnel? And is it because the um, FITS and early career cardiologists grew, um, in their training had work hour rules and more focus on work-life balance um, initiatives during their training versus the mid-career where um, work-life balance and those kinds of discussions just didn't exist for us. It's hard to say why that difference is, but these are just some speculations. Our data also showed that women reported burnout more frequently than men, and uh, a lot of that probably has to do not uh, with the um, additional responsibilities at home, but also the adverse or hostile work environment that exists in cardiology for women. Looking at our data too, um, those that were satisfied with their family life were less likely to report burnout. And um, those that uh, felt less satisfied with achieving professional goals or with their financial compensation were more likely to state that they were burned out. And those that experienced burnout were more likely to say that they experienced discrimination at some time during the training or profession. Um, and uh, interestingly, also those who are burned out are, uh, uh, are more likely to also state that they wouldn't recommend cardiology as a career to someone who's seeking advice. And that's a problem. We want to enc encourage more to come into the field that we love. And so clearly, if, they, if they're not recommending it, it tells you um, what their thoughts are about the profession. And looking at um, some of the other things that associated with the burnout uh, within uh, cardiology, our data shows that um, if you look here on the, um, the uh, z-axis here, no burnout is in the far right, far lower uh, bars, and all the way in the back are completely burned out, and then gradations here. You can see that um, those who spent excessive time on electronic medical records um, that prevalence was higher amongst those who were experiencing burnout or stress. The hectic work environment was more commonly reported in those who uh, reported um, burnout. Um, poor care team efficiency is also a, an issue and why we need to make sure we're enhancing our care team and that everyone's working at their top of their license and, um, and working effectively together. And insufficient documentation time, so that pajama time that we all do, is also contributing to burnout. In addition, the no control over workload. Um, you know, there's been a big shift in, in medicine over the last couple of decades and of, of more of the employment uh, model and that lack of uh, control that sometimes people feel is also contributory to burnout. And <clears throat> that data was from 2015, but if we look at our 2019 data uh, in cardiology, our burnout rates even increased even further um, from 27% up to 35%. Um, and women and mid-career cardiologists, once again, um, were more likely to uh, experience uh, higher rates of burnout. Um, and amongst those who plan to leave their current job, um, they, they, it was more likely uh, related to desire to spend more time with family or uh, work-related factors like RVUs uh, and so forth uh, were uh, issues of why they were thinking of leaving medicine altogether. Um, and so it was that need to have more work-life balance. Once again, here's our 2019 data looking at burnout and gender and women uh, 45 percent had reported experiencing burnout, whereas it was about 33 percent in men that were uh, re experiencing burnout. And, to, and, and the importance of this is that I want to highlight is, is that burnout is not just a female thing. Clearly, if a third of the cardiologists reported experiencing burnout, that's problematic. So one in three of us, if you look to the person to the right of you and left of you, one of you is probably experiencing burnout. And here's some recent data that got published this year um, from the ACC on uh, fellowship program uh, directors. And uh, the survey uh, asked eight questions about satisfaction stress amongst uh, the um, 
program directors. And, and, and about 45% of the program directors said that they were experiencing high stress levels and 21% said that they were um, burned out. Um, uh, and uh, once again, the burnout rates amongst the program directors were higher among women and mid-career cardiologists, as well as amongst those, uh, it was higher in those who had a larger program uh, size and then amongst those who were university-based uh, fellowship programs as opposed to community-based. Here's some uh, data that's been published by Christine Sinsky uh, looking at, um, they, they, they did time-based. And so they were observing um, how much time people spent um, in uh, their uh, offices and they took about 57 physicians. There were some that were family medicine, internal medicine, cardiology, and orthopedics. And in the time spent in clinic, only 27% is spent on actual direct patient care. Um, and a majority of it's spent um, in your room doing all these electronic health records. Uh, those of you who are old enough like me to remember what it was like um, pre-electronic health records, there was less time in our little offices and more time at the bedside or at the, uh, at the chair side with the patients uh, in clinic. Also what's concerning is, is our, the data she reported says that most clinicians spend one to two hours of evening time spent on administrative uh, tasks, including electronic health records. And that, that tasks um, is what we call as pajama time where we really should be relaxing. Um, uh, but uh, that's the only time people can feel that they can get things accomplished. And then uh, back in 2021, we also published data on the hostile work environment in cardiology, because I think the work environment also contributes to um, our experiences of burnout. And, um, and this data is actually global data that we um, had published um, and uh, about uh, sorry, 44% of cardiologists across the globe said that they were working in a hostile work environment. What is a hostile work environment? It's emotional harassment, sexual harassment, or discrimination. And of note, 67% of the women said that they were working in a hostile work environment. But also interestingly, 37% of men said that as well. So once again, yes, the prevalence is higher in women, but this is not, this is not to say that men aren't experiencing it too. And uh, in, in addition, almost 80% of the people who uh, said that they were working in a hostile work environment also reported that it had adverse effects on their professional activities with their colleagues, as well as with their patients. And so we need to make a fix of this. And then I, I don't want to say that this is only a physician thing. There is clearly data that shows that burnout rates are higher amongst our nurses and other um, allied healthcare professionals and healthcare workers. And clearly, you all are seeing that now even further uh, since the start of the pandemic. In the case that um, it's a hard to uh, have staff at the bedsides in the hospitals and in our clinic. And so the question becomes, is burnout really a problem with the person or environment? And our healthcare organizations need to help us solve this issue because it can cost uh, almost a million dollars to replace an existing physician. And it, it ends up becoming a moral injury um, altogether. And um, where do we start from here? Well, um, this is this is an, a, a nice opinion piece that we had written that I, I think that we're, we're not talking about burnout only. I, I think the better and bigger picture would be to say that we're really striving for professional fulfillment. Um, and uh, the, the way to understand that is to assess it. Um, and so doing surveys, surveys of burnout is important because burnout is our metric but well-being and professional fulfillment are really the goals that we want to strive to achieve this. The responsible parties are our healthcare organizations, our medical societies that also need to advocate for us, and then it's us as individuals that need to advocate at a local and national level as well. Well, what kind of strategy can we use? I think we need to look at it using the Stanford model that we need to look at a culture of wellness within our organizations and our professional societies. 
we need to strive for practice efficiency and what that practice efficiency is going to be different for each one of us. And then we need to also strive for person personal resiliency. And as a preventative cardiologist, I think of that we need to look at these strategies from three different angles. One is um, if someone's burned out, that we need to look at as a secondary prevention for them and then how to handle them. And if someone's highly stressed, that's really a primary prevention. But very importantly in prevention is primordial prevention, preventing events. And so seeking out what is keeping people in an optimal well-being, what is keeping them happy, and how do we shift our practices to more of that kind of model so that we have more people that are in optimal well-being states. Um, in uh, 2020, the ACC and AHA collaborated and had a consensus conference on professional professionalism and ethics. Um, the last time they had had a conference was in 2005 on this. And in 2021 in May, we published um, the, this document. Um, in, in the 2020 uh, conference was the first time that it was decided to add in um, um, the well-being of clinicians as a key uh, important aspect um, of it. And so there were certain areas um, that we included as, as strong recommendations. One area is that organization, there's organizational strategies that need to be implemented to promote well-being. And that, um, you know, health, one is that healthcare organizations must actively support and be accountable for the psychosocial health of their workforces. And it's not just providing uh, resources, but making the environment uh, also um, acceptable. And that there, there should be investments into uh, well-being research and interventions to sustain a work environment, which we can thrive in. And there needs to be a regular assessment of clinician well-being. Um, and, and that there needs to be organizational infrastructure to enhance well-being such that, um, that uh, there are senior leadership positions even in it, such as like chief wellness officers um, within an organization as well as at the divisional levels. And that healthcare organizations and medical societies really need to uh, participate and lead advocacy efforts to really change um, uh, or, or improve our well-being, such that there's attention to the regulatory and documentation requirements, removing the unnecessary stuff um, that exists and uh, impedes uh, our, our um, documentation requirements, but even mental health support, such that you know many many uh, clinicians don't seek mental health, especially physicians, they don't seek mental health help because um, of the effect on their credentialing, hospital credentialing, because uh, most of our institutes ask about that and even state licensing boards. And there has to be a change into uh, some of the uh, wording of it such that it's not about um, prior history, but is someone suffering now from it and how can we help them? Uh, and then in addition, there's um, there's addressing uh, well-being among trainees and researchers as well and making sure that we're incorporated into um, into their curriculum and promoting uh, process improvement science such that they're looking, they're learning about practice efficiencies and stuff. I think the uh, trainees have it a little bit better than us because per, they're uh, somewhat protected by ACGME, but once they become an attending, they've lost that protection. And so, and, and we need to, to keep it there. So this is a wonderful document that has a, a lot of information in it. So if you're looking at well-being for your organization, I would suggest that you kind of take a look at that um, and see, because, you know, cl clinician well-being um, it, it, it is really a, a big field um, and, and it involves a lot of things. It's about the mental health and how do we destigmatize it, but it's also about the uh, electronic re health records and the mental uh, support, the coaching that we provide our uh, colleagues advocacy, but importantly is a culture and the culture starts from the top and from the bottom and in between. Um, and making sure that we have a positive work environment, that we're inclusive, uh, and that we have zero tolerance for disruptive uh, behavior, and that there's a culture that work-life integration is acceptable, um, and uh, that that it's okay to to and not and not to be ashamed of having to and wanting to take time off for families. In addition, I want to pause for a minute and acknowledge that despite the data. Um, uh, of physicians not seeking help. I do want to acknowledge that, you know, someone may be listening to this uh, presentation today and may be feeling very burned out 
very sad, depressed, or, and just not sure um, and uh, scared. And I just want you to know that you're not alone. Remember that um, there are resources out there. There's a national suicide prevention line, which is highly confidential. And in the midst of COVID, there's this physician support line that exists um, that you can reach. It's staffed by volunteer psychiatrists for US physicians. Even if it's not related to COVID your issue, feel free to reach out to them. But I do wanna encourage you, don't feel ashamed to seek help. Um, there are many, many people seeking uh, help these days. So, um, and remember, this is all confidential. Switching gears, um, when I was younger, I used to think that there's work-life balance um, and uh, in actuality, I'd say that work-life integration and, and we need to recognize that, that, the, that um, we need to be able to work on integrating the different aspects of our entire life to, um, and to, to be meaningful. And, and sure, there are gonna be some times where um, uh, work becomes more prominent than family time, you know, like when we're on call um, uh, or, or um, on service, those kinds of things, it may take over. But there's other times where we need to prioritize our own um, families. And I think that one thing as physician cardiologists we neglect is, is, and there is some data on it, is, is that, you know, we promote our patients to do the um, 150 minutes of uh, aerobic exercise per a week, but cardiologists don't all do that. Um, so we don't practice what we preach. And, and there is data that shows that uh, people who are um, practicing that are less likely to be burnt out. So the issue of burnout, as I had said in the beginning, has been simmering for years. And it, you know, it was brought to a boiling point um, by mounting changes in healthcare. Um, with the implementation of the electronic health records, the performance and quality metrics that are mandated in us, and then the um, merging or employment models. But uh, COVID-19 has clearly um, put um, uh, an even bigger um, uh, dent in, into our lives and um, has created a lot of stress um, amongst us. And our data within uh, cardiology shows that uh, pre-pandemic uh, amongst U.S. cardiologists here, it's about 27% were experiencing uh, burnout. And now uh, at the peak of COVID, of what the, uh, what, what the survey respondent felt was the peak of COVID, it was at 40%. So there's a substantial increase in prevalence of uh, burnout amongst pre-COVID to, to peak COVID. You can see an even bigger jump amongst uh, fellows and trainings, as well as uh, U.S. cardiovascular team members who experienced it. The international cardiologists, um, we need to dig into that a little bit more. Is it um, uh, things are done different internationally or is it um, perception of the questions um, and so forth? We, I do want to take a step back and look at, um, you know, the things that motivate us as humans. Um, and this is Maslow's uh, triangle um, that he created. And it's a hierarchical uh, triangle. And that, you know, at the base is that we're all motivated by our physiologic needs um, and our safety needs. Those are the basic needs that, that we all need. So food, water, security. And then it's followed off with a, a need, uh, the psychological needs, which is belonging and love needs, and then esteem needs, feeling accomplishment. And then it's at the peak is self acquisition um, where you're achieving your full potential. And there is um, a physician burnout and wellness hierarchy that's been developed. And the basic needs of, you know, feel getting hydrated and having enough time to sleep and access to bathrooms um, are, are, are real uh, basic needs that, that we all face. Um, do we stay hydrated enough? Most of us would say no, uh, you know, things like that. Safety um, is, is a big issue in healthcare now. Um, and you see reports of, nurses, physicians, and so forth being attacked um, uh, um, and killed even um, in, in hospital settings or medical settings. And then uh, the third part of the triangle is respect. Uh, it, am I getting, getting a basic level of respect? So is my family time respected? Um, am I harassed by IT for these electronic health record issues? Um, and, 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 and so those are 
respect issues, and then appreciation. Am I noticed and appreciated? Does my compensation reflect appreciation? And appreciation doesn't always have to be compensation. There can be other things uh, as well, but the, it's the value, uh, the feeling of value. And then at the fifth, uh, uh, at the peak is heal patients and contribute. So do you have the autonomy and the time to heal your patients? And do you have the time to feel that you are contributing? Um, and, and these are the stages that, that we all um, go through. And, um, you know, men, you know, in the past, many of us would feel like we're healing our patients, but, you know, when it came to COVID, then people didn't feel that way necessarily. And it um, became problematic for us. And when we look at um, uh, our field, we know going into medicine that there are some inherent stresses um, that we can't fix. Um, you know, we're going to witness a lot of suffering. We're going to feel a lot of blame. We can't, we can't fix everything. Um, but there's some inherent rewards when you do fix things and you do heal things. But um, along with it, there's some added stresses, you know, the calls, electronic health records, and then there's the added rewards of income and benefits. But it's important to recognize that the, no amount of added rewards can really um, balance the curve in terms of uh, balance it in terms of the stresses and that um, we need to uh, really focus on the amount of stresses. You can't pay us enough to work even harder. I mean, we come to a tipping point and certainly we do need to also work on our resiliency, which will give us a little bit more um, ability to balance some of these stressors, but clearly there has to be changes made all around. And so going back to that Stanford uh, model, um, this is where we really need to make changes in, in terms of the culture of wellness, the efficiency practice, and pers personal resiliency. And those could be deep dives that you have to take at your institute level um, on, on making this happen and in, in investigating of um, how that can happen. I mean, culture of wellness, um, it could even be something simple as emails. You know, how many emails are you getting after hours from other colleagues that aren't really necessary to be done after hours um, and, and you feel obligated to, to look at it and respond to it. So there's delay send buttons or can you um, streamline the amount of emails that your organization sends out to each individual physician because that gets to be taxing and then it becomes email fatigue and then email apathy, um, efficiency of practice um, of how to make the clinic space run uh, easier and, and uh, more efficiently and having everyone practice at their top of their license. And so, you know, there's, there's on the left here, you can see all the stressors that can happen in a clinical work environment, but sometimes uh, making shifts is in terms of flexible schedules for our, our um, colleagues and even our staff is important. And, and it, it, it may make people be in the moment a little bit more um, when they're in at work. Um, making sure you're doing staff surveys is essential um, because uh, it's better to understand what's bothering them um, before they're just seeking out another job. Um, and making, trying to allow more time uh, in the clinical setting um, for that direct patient care and um, figure out ways to reduce electronic health record entry um, is, is gonna be on an individual basis as well. But there's clear data that shows that if we spend 20% of our time in a work week on the things that we really find valuable, we're less likely to burn out. And what that 20% can really vary. I mean, for, for one person, it may be, you know, I just want to do cats all that time. Or other people may be like, I just I would like 20% of that time of my time to be really on research or administration, or I really enjoy reading EKGs, whatever it is, could be clinical research or administrative. But if you could somehow figure out how can I get 20% of my work week um, into, into X, Y, and Z, then then I maybe I'd be happier because I find some meaning uh, into it. Organizations also need to develop some foundational programs, so some safety net resources for clinicians in distress. And so that's going to be your um, mental health resources. And there really needs to be um, campaigns to reduce stigma and to normalize the use 
of the organizational resources and decrease barriers for physicians and nurses to access those resources. Two is there needs to be resources for when people have uh, major life transitions like maternity and paternity leave. Um, there needs to be um, evidence-based self-care and wellness promotion offerings. Um, there has to be leadership development. Leadership development is key because there is data that shows that a leader can really impact the well-being of their um, employees. And, and we're all leaders in different ways. Like you, you, you may have a leadership title, but you could also be a leader of the care team uh, for that week. And, and uh, leadership uh, uh, development is, is key um, in terms of enhancing well-being. And um, there has to be deliberate programs to enhance uh, collegiality and community at work. And that's really hard now with COVID that, that there is no social um, events and recognition. And that, so it's, it's really made a challenge. And, um, you know, frankly, um, these Zoom social events are, are getting tiring as, as well. Um, people really want that in-person um, time. And then, as I said before, assessing well-being is, is going to be essential. Um, and then importantly is, is, is this uh, concept of getting rid of the stupid stuff, that there's little things. It's, it's not, it's what Muhammad Ali said, it's not the mountain ahead of us that's going to cause us trouble. It's going to be these little hills that'll be problematic. And for us, it's these little pebbles that are in our shoes, the little things that irritate us on a daily basis, the small things, if we can fix them, can really um, improve the overall well-being. Um, you know, one, so one pebble that I could think of is, is at our institute, every time like you went into a patient's room, you had to re-enter your password to get into the computer. And now um, we have a single sign-on with the badge reader. And that's really made it, that's a, stupid little thing, a little pebble in our shoe, but it, fixing it really uh, enhanced uh, our uh, happiness um, to, to some degree as well. And then the cultural transformation, as we discussed, is going to be um, key. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, everyone has to own well-being. Um, and we, we, and we all need to take a part in it, whether you're the leader of the organization or the group. Um, or whether you're, ju you're just one of the members of the group is, is looking at how we can make the culture and the environment acceptable. And, and um, I, I do want to say that yoga is not the sole preventative measure for burnout. Um, and, and that's important because many organizations have uh, focused on fix the employee and providing resources um, for the individual and, and have clearly overlooked the environmental factors of fixing the environment. Um, and so uh, the, remember that it's not just me and the issue is not just me because suddenly we have a huge array, uh, number of physicians across the country that are suddenly um, having issues, then it tells you it's the work environment. But there are some things that um, we uh, can think of and that we can uh, take um, take with heart. And so this was an article by Crowell um, uh, on the 10 commandments of wellness. You know, uh, no one's going to take responsibility for our wellness and we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to advocate for it. Um, and, and we're going to have to let people know what these are the little things. I think that letting the, but the discussions can't be in anger. The discussions really have to be in uh, positive criticism with some potential solutions. And that's how things can change. You know, we need to recognize that change in medicines can always happen. So we can't resist all change. Um, we need to make sure that we're not taking ourselves in vain and that we're um, do, do, taking care of ourselves, remembering what is holy to us, what brought us into medicine, remembering that we have limits. Just one more thing concept is not going to work. We're going to burn out. Remember, you're not at, uh, alone um, and, and uh, work as a team together efficiently. Don't take out our anger on others. We don't need to, um, to kill others um, or with our, our anger or and um, shifting our hard work to someone else's doesn't make sense. It's really about working smarter, not, not harder and making sure people are practicing at the top of their license um, and uh, seeking a joy and mastery in your work and then remembering to continue to learn throughout your profession 
keeps it uh, all well. Um, the ACC, we have a clinician well-being portal, um, and so there's plenty of information there on clinician well-being, as well as we have a um, um, uh, the in, within the COVID-19 portal on acc.org, there's information um, uh, there as well on uh, clinician well-being. And if there's more stuff that you want, feel free to email me and, and we can certainly add more things uh, to, to the plate. Um, it, but remembering to put on your psychological PPE and not just the um, physical PPE is, is important. Um, and so, you know, taking time for yourself and as a team leader, you know, recognizing um, that what's happening around you. I think we need to recognize if we're burning out, but also it's the responsibility of our colleagues to, to, to recognize that as well and to, 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 to check in with each other and make sure that we're doing okay. So um, I just have a few, uh, two questions uh, to, for you to think about. Um, uh, this is question one, Dr. Lee is a mid-career physician in a busy clinical practice in a large multi-specialty medical group. The group adopted a new electronic health record five years ago, and although Dr. Lee is thoroughly familiar with the features and shortcuts, she finds herself constantly behind in her clinic documentation. She spends at least two hours every evening after her children are in bed finishing notes and other documentation from the clinic encounters earlier that day. Recently, she also spends additional hours during the weekends devoted to chart completion, but now she's fallen behind and is not meeting organizational expectations for timely closure of clinic charts. And she knows that the other providers in her practice are experiencing similar challenges with clinical documentation. So what's the most important strategy for Dr. Lee to pursue in, in reducing the burden of clinical documentation? Um, she can A, shorten her clinic notes, she can complete them in less time. B, is reduce her clinic schedule and accept reduced compensation. C, uh, is hire uh, a scribe to assist her with documentation. Or D, is record her time in electronic health record and then share with organizational leadership. So when you look at that, I would say that shortening clinic time, shortening clinic notes is not always acceptable because there are some uh, meaningful uh, documentations that we need to do. Reducing your clinic schedule to take less money is not the solution and it doesn't bring professional fulfillment. Having a scribe is great and we all want that, but um, it's not always a cost-effective model and organizations don't always have that kind of resource to, to do. But going to your organization, on uh, the time that you're spending in the chart is important because they can help you figure out ways to be more efficient or there are unnecessary things that are falling upon the clinician that could be done by others is gonna be key. And then question two, Dr. Brady Cardia is a longstanding partner in your cardiovascular group. He's becoming increasingly um, irritable with colleagues, uncrest characteristically short-tempered, which staff shortly after implementation of a new electronic health record platform into the practice. He's not been threatening or abusive to colleagues or staff, and there have not been any perceived quality issues with his care or complaints from his patients, but there is a clear change in his personality. So what's your best response to Dr. Cardia as a professional colleague? Um, a, report him to his direct supervisor uh, for counseling. Um, that, that can be really um, challenging and that can, um, uh, you know, you really wanna approach the person in a non-threatening manner. So that wouldn't be appropriate. Reporting him to the state medical uh, licensing board uh, for unprofessional behavior. Um, there doesn't appear to be any overt uh, uh, behavior issues so that wouldn't work. Reprimand him for his uh, behavior and tell him that you think that he's experiencing burnout. Well, you want to really be non-judgmental, so that's not um, appropriate uh, either. Um, and so D would probably be the right answer of inquiring as to sen his sense of well-being and asking him how you can help to soothe in the situation. I think, you know, when we approach our colleagues, we want to be open and non-judgmental um, and, and, and understand where they're coming from and see if we can help um, as an individual or as an organization. I um, have heard the phrase crushed by the weight of feathers, um, but I would say um, in medicine, I, I think we're being crushed by the, the clicks. 
Um, and, and the clicks are really uh, impacting many of us, and we've all felt this way. Um, you know, and, and our patients and their family members have felt this, that um, this sheer ignorance uh, of the patient uh, because of this computer screen has taken over our time. And so it gets back to um, practicing at the top of our license. Um, and so, um, and, and what does that mean? That means like in your, uh, the care team roles that, you know, making sure that we're, you know, our nurse practitioners, our physician assistants and so forth, um, they're actually seeing patients and they're unloading the number of patients that we need to see. They're seeing patients, they're not acting as our scribes. Um, they're 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 acting at the top of their license, and then we're incorporating. If you have the ability of pharmacists to kind of help with some of those medication reconciliations, and that our nurses are um, I, um, um, are able to function as nurses, the things that brought them joy in in medicine as well, um, and that's key. But if if you haven't seen it already, Z Dog MD, who is a hospitalist, also has his own. Um, video platforms uh, and he um, posted this uh, video of EHR uh, state of mind and I like to think of it as that the EHR is a glorified billing platform with some patient stuff tacked on. I, I love that statement from his song and I really do believe that that's what it is and, but unfortunately we're stuck with the electronic health records the way they are unless there's um, some revolutionary new company that isn't so expensive uh, that and uh, hospitals will would be willing to shift over. But medical scribes is is really one way to 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 do it. Um, and I said earlier that it may not be fruitful um, from a compensation standpoint. Um, but uh, I, I I do know of some people that have enjoyed having scribes. Um, and to make it economical for them, that meant that they, they would need to see more patients just to pay off this. The, the cost of the scribe, but they still felt happy and they still felt that they could finish on a timely manner um, because the scribe did all of that other stuff so that they were they were able to balance it. And so, you know, looking at the um, cost uh, uh, benefit ratio is, is going to be key. Um, scribes, uh, some people do say, does make it challenging in terms of the warm up or for uh, them to catch up to speed. Many of the scribes are um, pre-med students and so they, they have a true uh, enjoyment of this. So there's a learning curve that needs to be there. There's others that have um, used uh, artificial scribes, so artificial intelligence. So the scribes really not in the room with you. They're somewhere halfway across the world um, doing the uh, transcriptions for you. So that's an, another model. Um, I want to share with you um, another thought of mine, um, an uh, example of where burnout can be problematic, um, or and this can lead to burnout, is the my chart. My chart equals my headache, and this is a patient message, and it's really lengthy. And to sum it up, it's they have two complaints: palpitations and chest discomfort. But really, this adds to the electronic fatigue. This constant accessibility that the patients have to us, things that they may not have even called us on in the past, certainly they would have for these. But um, this is what my staff uh, had sent uh, me, um, please advise. Um, and, and there was nothing to the fact of the staff calling the patient or checking out what's going on. It was just like, let me just shift it to you. And, um, and then and so I think that, you know, when we talk about the practice efficiency is, is when you see things like this is working with your staff, I'm like, okay, well, let's work out a plan of like when patients send X, Y, and Z messages, why don't you um, call them and here are certain questions you can ask them and certain um, triage things that can be done. And, and that can kind of help reduce some of the um, my chart headaches that you get or the refill of medications and, and that they're just coming to you and you have to refill them. Well, can someone tee them up? And in some states, the 
the, they can send them as uh, verbal orders under you, and that can kind of help as well. So those are things that, you know, we as individuals can look at practice efficiency models, but you have to have your eyes open and think of, okay, this is something, this is this little pebble that's bothering me, but, and now like, how can I fix it? And let me find something that's feasible within our organization from um, uh, an economical standpoint is, um, is, is essential. And then those of you who are echocardiographers and old enough like me may have remembered on Saturday mornings this uh, commercial, um, Mr. Owl, how many, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll? And as an echocardiographer, mine is, is how many clicks does it take to read an echo or to get through an echo day? And let's say like in, in our um, cardiology setting that we have inpatient or outpatient, we read 30 plus echoes in a half day, um, although it's more than a half day, but yes, um, for half days, it's this many echoes and that's about 50 to 60 clicks to see the images. And then you've got 50 clicks or so to enter the report. So you're looking at almost 5,000 clicks just for an, for an echo. And so what does that lead us to? Well, echocardiographers are at the risk of carpal tunnel and, uh, that, so just like the interventionals have the back pain from the um, lead, this is what we're at risk for. And, um, and so what is one potential solution? One potential solution that you could look at at your institute is, is can the echo uh, report uh, be prelimbed by a technician? Um, or at least the salient features entered in by the technician such that uh, you are less likely to miss um, some important findings. Um, well, why the echo technician? Um, well, the echo technician has spent like 45, 50 minutes with that patient looking closely at those images versus you who's spending five minutes or less reading that echo. And so it helps with um, the quality of your reads. It also helps with the quality feedback for the technician because, you know, they, they're more likely, like when they're obligated to, to give a report, they're more likely to, to have a perhaps better image quality um, looking at that EF and so forth. Um, but that requires a culture change and there certainly needs to be buy-in uh, for a team. But these are like simple examples of what you can think of in terms of how you can make meaningful potential change at, at the local level for you. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that, you know, you, you know, we've discussed the drivers of burnout, be on the lookout for your inner self and those around you um, for burnout. Remember that burnout's more than just a resiliency issue. Um, it's, it's a systemic issue. And that professional fulfillment is really what we strive for. Um, it's not reduction of burnout. It's our truly a professional fulfillment and feeling well. And then recognize that you can impact um, your own well-being and your organizational well-being um, when you um, partner with others and partner with your organization and advocate. And then remember, this is a marathon. It's going to take a long time to make changes. And there's always going to be new things that are going to affect our well-being. And we need to understand that it's not a sprint and we have to be agile and, uh, and so forth to, to make a difference. But most importantly, remember um, that, you know, you need to put your own oxygen mask on before assisting others. And so we do need to help each other and ourselves first. Thank you. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation, Dr. Maida. It looks like we just have a couple minutes for Q&A. If that's okay, we could take a couple questions. Um, as a reminder to our Zoom attendees, please use that Q&A pod located at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask any questions. Um, and as we wait, I do have a few that are loaded up here. Uh, the first of which is uh, at OSU, what are you doing to evaluate and treat clinician well-being uh, currently? Thank you. Um, so we have a we have a survey that we uh, deployed earlier. Um, uh, sorry, we're in 2022 and 2021, and and we're looking at that data from a uh, from a culture of wellness. Um, we've asked uh, we've asked like the division chiefs um, what, uh, certain requirements that we think that they need to to do in terms of. Uh, establishing a culture such as the email issues. Um, that's that's a big thing. And actually email fatigue ended up being the number one thing that was really bothersome to, to our um, 
clinicians. So um, adding that, um, making sure that the leaders understand that there's um, leadership behavior and, and we're gonna work on a, a leadership curriculum for that. Um, in terms of uh, the practice uh, efficiencies, um, some of them, you know, we've talked about. So some some people have been offered scribes, um, but they have to increase their um, uh, number of patients. Um, then uh, looking at, uh, you know, we wanted to do more in terms of the clinical efficiency. What we're struggling with, and you might be too, is, is the fact that the um, shortage of healthcare uh, workers in our offices and in the hospitals. So, um, you know, being cognizant of not overburdening uh, the uh, support staff is, is something that we're trying to be sensitive to, but um, figuring out other ways. Um, so in our clinics, having the nurses do some of the um, medication reconciliation has been important. And then um, personal resiliency is a thing. Is, and so we're going to be offering webinars, um, but not the typical webinars that, um, that you'll see at your institutes about mindfulness, but really about um, things such as um, microaggressions, because um, remember we talked about that hostile and work environment. How do you respond to it? How do you um, be an upstander? But uh, also things about um, uh, leadership development for the individual um, and um, how to learn, learning how to say no, things like that. So uh, we have to take a broad scope to make, to make it accessible. We, we're also going to be um, working with leadership on uh, allowing um, uh, external um, uh, mental health resources, because we also recognize that many of our clinicians don't want to seek um, mental health services internally within our organization from a confidentiality concern standpoint. So that's something else that we're working on. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much for that. It makes a ton of sense. Um, so a quick follow-up question to that. You had mentioned uh, doing a survey. Um, so a follow-up question is, what survey, if there is one available, would you recommend? Sure. There's there's several different surveys out there. The Myers-Briggs is probably the survey that you hear about the, the most and has been used in research. Um, but the, the issue with the Myers-Briggs is it, it, it comes with a cost. Um, and, and so uh, we actually use uh, mini, the Mini-Z survey. Um, and actually, that originated out of your very own state of uh, Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Mark Linzer uh, used that in the uh, primary care uh, setting. And, and, it's been, and that's, the, that's the survey we used for the uh, ACC as well. In addition to the 10 questions that he asks, We've, we've added questions from Stanford on professional fulfillment and then our own questions on, you know, the little pebbles or things that we see at an organizational level that we thought might be impacting our clinicians. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. It looks like we just have time maybe for one more question. Uh, this question uh, comes from an anonymous attendee, uh, and it's related to the electronic health record. So a great talk uh, that they agree that time on the uh, electronic health record is a large driver of burnout. Uh, and I know you touched on this, but if you could just elaborate a little bit, do you recommend the organization assess the time on uh, the electronic health record outside of work hours? Yeah, that that can be um, that that is one way to, to look at it is assessing the um, time outside. Um, I, I it does come with some caveats, though. Um, I would say, you know, we all work different shifts, right? So like if 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 you're if you're working later, um, like if, if you're on service and you're later then that, those hours may be varied. In addition, I know like when I was um when my kids were young um, and in elementary and middle school, for me, it was really important to get out of clinic at a decent time so that I could go to their activities. And so I kind of made it a flexible career by then doing some of the stuff in the evening. So, so you, you know, you have to take it with a grain of salt because, you know, some, there are things sometimes when people prefer to do it in the evening um, because they want to, be able to flex their schedules a bit. Um, so, but yes, um, I, I I think that what organizations can also do is 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 really look at um, how do we make that time in the chart more efficient, um, and 
uh, and that's essential. So like the time that I'm documenting and, and is there things that other people could preemptively put in the chart or when the patient's coming in, you know, one of the things that patients even find frustrating, and I don't know if that's just an epic thing for us at a high state or is it for you guys, I, I'm, I'm not even sure what system you guys use, but um, you know, patients complain that they've, they've looked at their records and they've, they've made changes um, from their end when they're checking in, but they're not accounted for. And so I have to re-ask it and remove their medications and re-update their things. And so they get frustrated too. So are, are there things that can be streamlined that the patient's allowed to do in their record that we don't have to always um, be double clicking and checking? And um, one of the things that I, I want to look at this upcoming year is an educational model on to, for, for patients on how to use my chart because I think it's kind of abused and used in the wrong way. Um, and um, so putting some boundaries on it is gonna be important for our patients as well. Absolutely, well, thank you very much for your time this morning. I see that there is a question in the Q&A pod about the recording of this. Um, so just know uh, to all of our attendees that we will post this on our website and that should be up today within a couple hours. Uh, Dr. Maida, thank you so much for your time. Do you have any uh, final words for us? No, thank you. And I wish you all um, happiness and professional fulfillment. Thank you for inviting Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks, you too.